I'll, I'll, I'll probably I'll light up a field. That's what I'll do. There's a field going across here, um, and uh, and and there's a, you can barely see it in that. But the, the, there's a little hedge that comes down, and it creates a nice shape. Uh, now, if I light this, it brings you to this side of the composition, and then this little this little bit here can bring you back in. So before I was talking about tapering this to go the other way, uh, but you know I'm thinking that might not be convincing. So you, I'm constantly looking for uh, opportunities to adjust what I've got here to to make the composition better. Um, concepts of clouds and the way that they, they bellow up uh, came to me in about 2007 or something. Um, or, or, or I kind of had a moment where I thought, and I always think back to this one moment, and it's in Hawaii, um, and I was with my now wife, with her, it's basically my brother-in-law's wedding. It was my wife now's uh, brother's wedding in Hawaii. He was getting married to Hawaii. And we were over there, Waikiki, and Waikiki's got this really big hill, and then it comes down very sharply to the beach. And what happens is you get a huge amount of rainfall on the hill, and then it all clears before it gets to the beach. So you get these ridiculous cumulus clouds rising up. And I was on the balcony, and there was the, the colors in the evening that lit this cumulus cloud. Um, just got a translucency I hadn't seen before, or I hadn't maybe noticed before. Sometimes you've seen it before, you just haven't looked. So I kind of got my wife out to the balcony, I said, right, stand there. Perfect, and I took the shot, and I, I think about that shot so much. I don't look at the, I don't look at the photo. It's in here, and so much is ingrained on your mind. The more that you can have ingrained in your mind and, and in your imagination, the more that you can release yourself from this. Um, so that that moment was was good, and, and then you come back and and this fantastic skies in Scotland, but you've got to go to the right places to see them. Actually in Barra, you've got pretty boring skies, it's very flat, and it's out in the middle of nowhere, and you don't get those dramatic changes. I'm not a geologist, and I don't know anything about weather, but, but what happens at the, at the, at the tops of, of really high hills is that you get that evaporation. And I've got this time-lapse video, <coughs> um, a video I took of me visiting Aaron, sketching, and then coming back. And then I came back and we stayed at the hotel, <laughs> at the golf course, the Royal Marine Hotel. And I took a time-lapse video of the clouds and the way that they created themselves from the hills. And they, they, they just started creating themselves uh, and belling up and they're just changing all the time and, and, and coming round. Now, as it is in this photo, it's not going to help my composition because this is boring. This is just plain boring. Boring skies are fine as long as you've got complexity to the foreground or the, or the land. You either have if you've got complexity here and complexity here, nobody knows where to settle. So I'm going to try to create shapes to give you a change of scale to the headland. And these are the shapes that I that I want to. Normally I wouldn't make these marks in, but uh, these are the shapes that I want, and I want that, that interest coming about there where the light source would be. And these, these big shapes stop you from leaving the painting and, and, and looking at what else is on the wall. <laughs> so, now I've got a very left dominated composition, so I need somebody uh, to, to be able to appreciate <coughs> this side. So, but if you compete too much with this, you've lost them. So I want a, a, a quite a, a definite movement in here. This is when we can control the speed at which someone looks at a painting. I can control someone's speed with a brush stroke and say, well, you're going to look from there to there really quick if I connect it with a big line. Um, that's just a guideline. It'll be kind of broken. I can break that line. can break that line and the speed at which you go from there to there will slow down quite a lot. And uh, the, because the, the light source is here, um, the light source is here is going to be kind of lit 
down down here. So this is going to take your attention away. So I'm going to really have to do something special with uh, <coughs> with the the, tr the transition of these shapes into the other side of the painting. Uh, and also my, my little idea with lighting up a field about. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to light up that field. I normally kind of wouldn't go here to this stage of, of, the, of the painting, of, of, of dropping in that green. Um, but I want to get it done before I start that other painting. I'm going to check the time as well. Right, I'm about the halfway stage. It's, not, it's only going to take me 20, 30 minutes to do what I need to do with the other painting. Um, so I'm going to continue this in another half hour. Um, and hopefully I'll get somewhere near the stage of that one here, so that we get a two-stage process, start and finish with two different paintings. Sometimes you just need to let the paint dry so that you can paint dry on dry, uh, wet on dry rather than wet on wet. Wet on wet has the ability to give you the translucency. If you paint an opaque colour on top of a wet, other opaque colour <coughs> or transparent colour, you begin to mix the paint together when you apply it, and that creates translucency even though it's an opaque colour you're, you're applying, because the mix between that and the colour that's already there merges the two colours closer together, which is all that happens with transparency anyway. Okay, I'm going to go straight in with this, this colour that I'm a bit obsessed with, with at the moment. I don't like to keep the same palette for every painting, so if anyone's interested in the colours that I'm using particularly, the only ones that, that, remain, uh, that remain consistent are, are cyan, magenta and yellow. Because I can't achieve those colours with any other paint because I can't mix them. I can get away with not even having cadmium red. I can mix my red by glazing magenta on top of yellow to leave it alone which actually makes it a much more uh, glowing red because there's translucency there. Glazing, and we'll get into glazing on the second painting. Um, red and green shouldn't be seen. Uh, <coughs> but this is going to be a much, much more of a, a yellow green, which is why I'm using this. Now immediately I've got a completely different colour and it's jarring. Uh, my latest exhibition was called Consonance and Dissonance. This is another concept of my paintings where I'm trying to create a, a harmony with the colours, uh, but I'm also trying to create a deliberate jarring of the colours for visual excitement. But creating, a, that, that's the difficult bit. Injecting the dissonance uh, for, for excitement is, is a difficult kind of concept to, to achieve. And it's certainly not achievable at this stage of the painting, but I've got a reading of what that is going to achieve later on now. And I can make judgment calls on the other colours to try and create more of a consonance with that. A lot of my paintings at the moment are titled with uh, terms of music, le levanto, legato, uh, and it's, it's all reference to the mark making, uh, slowly softening. Crescendo Sky was a recent one that I did where things built up to a main cumulus cloud. Um, so the, I believe that we should have more terms like that for the visual arts. Uh, we've got so many great Italian terms for the way things are uh, paced and the way things sort of staccato. I've done a lot of staccato show where every mark is just a very um, deliberate, um, de deliberate direct mark and move like crackles across the foreground. Okay, uh, Kermit's white again, and just watch what happens when you apply Kermit's white to that colour, it starts to go yellower, um, uh, strange, um, so that's when you can't really predict, I've got a lot of colour theories videos online, there's actually a, there's now a, a playlist of all of them, which lasts about an hour and a half. Um, but you pretty much, even though there's theory behind it, you pretty much can't predict it sometimes. The idea with the colour wheel is if you, I, I, 
you wouldn't believe it, but you can actually mix yellow with red and green. And I do a demonstration on one of my videos that shows me mixing yellow with red and green. And you probably think, wow, what, how can you do that? Well, if you mix red with green and then lighten it, you begin to get such sandy yellow. And the yellow that you end up with is somewhere around here. Um, because in the colour wheel, if you mix that one with that one, you get grey. If you mix uh, magenta with green, you get grey. But if you mix magenta with like a cobalt blue, you will get a desaturated purple. Uh, if you mix purple with uh, cyan, or for cyan, think cerulean, uh, cerulean or manganese, uh, if you mix these two colours, you will also get this desaturated blue colour. Um, but red and green seems to be the surprising one that artists are like, oh, I never thought of. You know, if there's a beach or something, mix the sandy colour with red and green and, and add titanium white. Um, I'll maybe demonstrate that because it's probably done with a clip that's, that's possible. In fact, yeah, that's my palette knife. I had a bunch of them. So we'll go for uh, cadmium yellow and uh, uh, yellow, I'm mixing yellow. So I would kind of go, well, we'll go with this green that I'm using here and we'll add a bit of cadmium red to it. Um, cadmium red, because it's opaque, I don't know if you can see this. Um, cadmium red, because it's opaque um, uh, and, and because it's it's a massively dominant colour uh, a lot of the time. You need, you need much less red than you will green. Uh, but also because the green that I'm using is, is actually to this side. It's, uh, what's that green? Bright green lake. And uh, it's kind of a yellower green. So I'll need more of the, the green than the red because it pulls me closer to the yellow. Uh, so I'll just gradually add a little bit of cadmium red to my green and I get this weird brownie colour because red and green make brown, because they're not complements. I've got this kind of colour here, oh, you're not going to see that. Uh, kind of greeny brown. You can add more cadmium. Uh, but if I take that titanium white and add it there, <coughs> I've got a derivative of yellow. Well, it's, it's a bit greeny just now, but I just need to add a little bit of cadmium red, and it, and it brings it closer to yellow. Um, and actually, the, the addition of some more uh, white will give you the, about that colour there. So this colour, which could describe sand on a beach, is mixed with red and green. Which is a kind of weird one. Okay, uh, I, I was needing a yellow. <laughs> um, and I was needing something...